Welcome to topic 7.15. Um, the point like with two numbers after just always irritates me. But anyhow, this is comparison in period seven. It's the last topic of period seven, which is a long period. And our learning objective is to compare the relative significance of major events of the first half of the 20th century in shaping American identity. So, okay, as you could imagine, the big skill for period seven is going to be comparison. So we haven't seen this, honestly, a ton in this course so far, just because like in the earlier days, right, you don't have a ton to compare to because we haven't moved through enough content. In period seven, we re really do start to see more comparison. And period seven is a longer period. So a lot of questions that assess period seven do have to do with comparing earlier parts of period seven to later parts of period seven. So this skill is gonna ask you to describe similarities and differences. And we've been saying this for a while now, right? Between historical developments. So like a good example would be, can you compare the relative significance of events that shaped American identity in World War I to um, events that shaped American identity in World War II? So like, if we think of how we looked at joining the League of Nations, maybe, versus how we looked at joining the United Nations, if we looked at our ideas in terms of isolationism going into either world war, how are they maybe different from one another? And also to what extent are we evaluating, evaluating, valuing intervention too? So um, the world wars, I think, serve as a really good point um, that can be compared, right? Because they're very similar situations to an extent, but there's differences in the nuances and how they're handled and what happens, okay? So the two wars, like I just said, they provide cases of multiple variables. Um, the College Board does like to kind of compare and contrast the two world wars, okay? Um, the first variable could be political conditions. So Wilson was less willing to compromise, maybe, than FDR at the conclusion of these wars, or even when getting involved in these wars. Um, military situation. Entry to World War One is going to be pretty controversial, but in World War II, Pearl Harbor is really going to mobilize Americans to support the president and FDR and support our involvement in the war. In terms of diplomatic relations, World War I, allies of the United States were all democracies for the most part. But in World War II, we are going to be aligned with the USSR, the Soviet Union, which is a communist totalitarian dictatorship that has very, very different values than we have here in the United States under our democracy with capitalist values. And then finally, on that same note, national values. After World War I, the people are going to want to act on, sorry, their own accord regarding foreign affairs and that the US kind of acts alone in making those decisions. But by 1945, a lot of American, a lot of Americans and even the government, they're gonna realize the need for collective security, that many nations are going to have to work together to promote peace and prosperity in a post-World War II world. So again, these are a lot of multiple variables that we can assess when looking at um, these two, again, similar instances in American world history. But again, they do have like these very varying nuances and complications. Okay, so your packet does have a couple of questions about comparison. I think this is good <laughs> to complete in terms of review. Like I do think that I've seen time and time again, these types of concepts being assessed on either like tests or the AP exam in general. So um, I would just brainstorm a couple of ways that you could answer these questions for specifically what is some outside evidence or historical evidence or specific evidence you could use to support a claim for something like this. So um, the first example that you have is compare the significance of the 1920s with the period of 1933 to 1945 in shaping beliefs about assimilation of migrants and minorities as a part of the American national identity. So how do our um, ideas about immigration and migrants change from the 1920s to the next period in the 30s and the, and the early 40s as well, okay? The second one is compare the relative impact of the reforms of the progressive era and the reforms of the New Deal in shaping the views and the economy and capitalism as a part of the American national identity. So um, what similarities do we see between these two sets of reforms, whether it's the progressive era or it's the New Deal? Um, what are some of the differences or the key differences between them? All right, and that's pretty much, oh wait, no, 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 I forgot. You guys have kind of like this new thing. I think this is really handy. I really, really highly suggest you pause the video for a second and you take a minute to go through 
these instances and these lists and identify the pattern or like the unifying factor between all of them. Okay, like the first one that they give you is the purchase of Alaska, the annexation of Hawaii, and the Spanish-American War. And I want you to think to yourself, what is the like common denominator? What is the common factor? What is something that unifies all of these things together, okay? Um, or what is the pattern that we can track for all three of these, okay? So here's the first one as an example, maybe before you pause the video, but all three of these, like immediately what should go off in your head is American imperialism, right? Like we acquire Alaska, we acquire Hawaii, we um, engage in the Spanish-American War at the very beginning of this unit in some of the first topics as we're looking to expand and conquest and find new markets for goods and all of those values that we saw with American imperialism at the beginning, oh my gosh, of this period, okay? So take a second and pause. And then when you're done, come back and I'm actually gonna go through each of these and give you like the common denominator or the pattern or whatever you wanna call it that links all of these terms and lists together. So, if you're done pausing and you've come back, here is number two. Two is commercial radio becoming popular. Um, talking pictures are going to debut and jazz music is going to become widespread. So again, the first thing you should think of, I would argue is the 1920s, but more specifically, you should think of the consumerism and tech of the 1920s and how that has a profound impact on American society and culture. The next list is the Trail of Tears. So that's actually a callback to like period Four, but this is a good practice to get in, in terms of um, comparison prompts, for sure. So we've got the Trail of Tears, we've got the Dawes Acts, and we've got the overthrow of Queen Lily Lupulani. The common denominator here, now you might know, like, hey, Trail of Tears and Dawes Act, these are going to have to deal with Native Americans. This one has to actually do with imperialism. What I'd say the unifying factor here is, is American expansionism as a whole, and elements of social Darwinism, this idea that like white American culture is superior to the culture of um, Native Americans or even like the Hawaiian monarchy at this time. Okay, and that's the idea and the trend of the time. Four is jingoism, the Cuban revolt of 1895 and the sinking of the USS Maine. Again, that could kind of like set off a like a light bulb moment and you might think of the Spanish American War, but then um, further and more specifically, I would say these are all causes of the Spanish-American War because we've got like extreme nationalism and fear of immigrants, right? We have um, the Cuban revolt, which gives the American people sympathy for the Cuban, Cuban people at this time that are being led by the Spanish. And then finally, the sinking of the USS Maine is like that last spark that gets us involved in the conflict. The last one is increasing power of big business and the rise of the urban middle class agitation for women's suffrage, okay, and then opposition to Jim Crow, okay, so all of these as a unifying factor when you look at them all across the board, essentially, you could see like progressive era movements and reforms or reasons for progressive era movements and reforms. I would argue you could maybe also say something like you know, the Gilded Age too, to an extent, like when we were talking about like the New South and some of like the Gilded Age and the problems of the Gilded Age, I really think either of those answers could work either way but I just happened to put this down, this one down first. Okay, so that brings us to the end of period seven. So I will see you guys in class. We'll do a couple of activities with these last couple of topics, but we're mainly going to review for our test for period seven, which we will see coming up very, very shortly. Okay, so congratulations. We've got another one down and we've only got period eight and nine to go.